it's time to get into the recommendations for the best cameras out there. All right, so in this section, I'm gonna go through two things. First off, I'm gonna walk you through the different manufacturers and the different systems that they have available and be talking a little bit about, is this an outgoing system? Is this an incoming system? Is it a good one to get into or maybe one that you will want to avoid? And then we'll get into the specific camera recommendations for different categories of photographers. I have lots of different categories and what cameras might be best for that category. Before we dive in, I do want to say, though, that these are my personal recommendations. I am as unbiased as you can get on this. I have nothing to win or lose whether you buy a camera or not in one category in one way or the other. I am unsponsored, and I am just looking to match people up with the right camera for them. It's not about finding the best camera. And I remember working in the camera store and having people come in from time to time and somebody who maybe had a lot of money, they'd say, I just want the best camera. And I'm like, well, this is the most expensive one, but that doesn't mean it's the best one. You, what you wanna find is you wanna find the right camera for you and the purposes that you're doing. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the major brands that are out there and what they are offering. Let's start with Canon. They have the largest part of the photographic community out there. More professional shooting, more people shooting Canon than any other brand. Right now, Canon is focused wholeheartedly on their mirrorless full frame system. This is where they've been coming out with lots of new cameras recently and lots of new lenses. And so this is a direction a lot of serious and professional photographers are going to go. Now, these cameras in general, can be a little bit on the expensive side. Uh, the RP, their entry-level one, is a very affordable camera, and Canon, luckily, along with their very high-end pro lenses, have been coming out with an occasional lens that's very affordably priced. And so Canon is really a, kind of attacking this market, both from the top and the bottom. Now, the Canon crop frame mirrorless is kind of an interesting diversion. The thing that's unusual about this is that this was uh, developed several years ago. It has a unique lens mount completely different than the full frame mirrorless cameras and there's no interchanging of cameras and lenses between the crop frame mirrorless Canon and the full frame mirrorless Canon. And so there is a lot of limitations when it comes to the expanse of the system, the available lenses, and other accessories in the crop frame mirrorless. If you were looking for a very small size mirrorless camera, Canon makes some very nice ones here, but it, it, it does have kind of a glass ceiling when you want to get to the more serious lenses that you, you just can't go to and you would have to do a full system changeover to go full frame. And so if you are pretty serious about your photography, you'd want to look at the full frame mirrorless system from Canon. If you want to get something smaller, lighter weight, and you're not going to get too heavily into it, then the, uh, the M system would be fine there. Now, Canon, of course, has been hugely popular over the last 20 years and more with their digital and regular SLR cameras. Now, they've only had one new camera in this category in the full frame DSLR in the last four years. So that clearly shows you they're not paying too much attention here. This is not the focus of what they're driving. These are great cameras in here. I still have at least one of these, and I'll probably be keeping it for quite a while because I do like that camera quite a bit. They did have a lot of cameras that are in the crop frame DSLR category, and this is where some of the most affordable, versatile cameras for getting into photography are. If there was a student on a very tight budget, these crop frame DSLRs are gonna give you a huge bang for the buck down here. But with no new cameras in the last two years, they have a limited selection of lenses dedicated to that crop frame DSLR system. It's clearly focused on full frame mirrorless with Canon. Next up, let's talk about Nikon. Nikon is a great name in the history of photography and they, the strong competitor to Canon, are following very much the same path. They are focusing on their full frame mirrorless cameras at this time. They have a collection starting at entry level, medium, higher end, high resolution, and flagship Z9 with kind of everything in there. And so this is where they are focusing their new attention with new bodies and new lenses, and it's where they are going once again. 
They do have a couple of crop frame mirrorless cameras that use the exact same lens mount and can use all the same lenses as the full frame mirrorless. So this is a little bit more versatile than what's going on with the Canon system. Now, I don't know how many more lenses they're gonna bring out that are dedicated exclusively for these crop frame mirrorless. Nikon kind of has a bad history when you look at their DSLRs of coming out with lenses exclusive to the crop frame version. They seem to get shortchanged and they seem, well, you should buy the full frame lenses. And they don't have a lot of options down there. And so it's a good way to get entry into the market and get into the system. And then you could move up to full frame a little bit more seamlessly. Like Canon, they have kind of abandoned the DSLRs for the most part. They do have two new cameras in the last four years. Usually they would bring out a couple cameras a year. These ones from Nikon and the DSLR full frame category, these are probably gonna be the last great DSLRs from Nikon. They, like Canon, also have a great collection of crop frame DSLRs. Uh, some very good options for students who are looking for a big bang for the buck. Somebody who is interested in getting into sports photography with a larger telephoto lens, there's gonna be a lot of easy, affordable options in this DSLR category. And so if you are new to photography, you want to get in and you want to go where everyone's going, both Canon and Nikon are in that full frame mirrorless camp as that looks like it's the direction they're going to be really focusing for the next 10 years or so. All right, Sony. So Sony has a completely different scenario, but they also have four different collections of cameras and lenses. Now, like Canon and Sony, they are focused on their full frame mirrorless bodies. And they kind of have a, a little different setup than a lot of other manufacturers. A lot of times manufacturers will make three or four different cameras that have more and features, more features, more features, more features, and it's just less and more. What Sony's done is they've kind of targeted different types of photographers. Their Sony a7C is designed for people who want a really compact camera. The Sony a7 Mark IV is kind of their general base camera. The S model is for people who shoot a lot of video. The R model has more resolution, oftentimes for landscape or product photography, something where you need large enlargements from it. The A9 series is dedicated more to sports photography. And the A1 is for someone who can't decide and wants everything. And so it kind of tries to do the best of everything in that category. Now, Sony has a common lens mount with all of their mirrorless cameras, so their cropped frame mirrorless cameras can use their full frame lenses, which is quite handy. They have not been coming out with as many cropped frame mirrorless cameras recently. And I think this is part of that trend that I have mentioned towards the higher end, more expensive models. And so we don't have as many cropped frame lens options uh, with the Sony mirrorless here as we do in the full frame, but there are probably more crop frame lenses for Sony than for Nikon or for Canon. And so if you did want to get into crop frame mirrorless, Sony is probably the best way to go from a system standpoint. Now, Sony did make DSLRs. They were technically called SLTs, something that's separate I'm not going to get into. And these are all discontinued. Uh, they might still be available in the store. Uh, you can still get some lenses for them. You can still find camera bodies out there, but this is a system that is dead. They are no longer supporting it as far as coming out with new equipment. They will continue to do repairs and so forth, and you'll get that taken care of for a while, but they are full on into mirrorless. And if you do have one of these DSLR systems and you just want to get a part to keep up what you have going, get it now before they're all gone. All right, as we dive into the other manufacturers, you're gonna see that they all have their own designs and layouts. And so Fuji, they decided when they went into digital is that they were gonna kind of really go hard at the crop frame world. This allows them to have slightly smaller cameras, but still have very good image quality. And I think these are fantastic cameras. I really, really enjoy using the Fujis. They have a lot of retro design, so there's a lot of shutter speed dials and mechanical touch controls on the camera, which I think are great. The cameras themselves and lenses are a little bit smaller, and they're the only company that really has a large line of crop frame lenses for their cameras. And so if you want the most complete line of lenses for a smaller size camera, 
I think this is probably one of the best ways to go. Now, Fuji decided to not do full frame because there was probably so much competition already out there, they wanted to differentiate themselves. So they went into medium format and they've come out with a number of cameras that compete pretty closely with full frame in terms of price, but they have larger size sensors and capabilities beyond what full frame have in many ways. And so uh, we're not gonna compare this medium format with full frame right now. It's kind of a separate subject right there. But if you are looking for smaller crop frame cameras, Fuji is a great one to be looking at. All right, Panasonic, as I mentioned before, and Olympus worked to create this micro four thirds system. It's a smaller size sensor that allows for cameras to be yet again, a little bit smaller with smaller size lenses. And they have really come at this market with a lot of technology. And so they bring a lot of things to the game that other companies do not. And so if you are looking for kind of a very tech savvy camera, then the Panasonic is a great way to go. They are also extremely good in video. Panasonic has a whole video division. They make a lot of video cameras, and so they know exactly what they're doing when it comes to making a camera that can shoot stills and video. And so if video is important to you, size is important to you, the Panasonic cameras are great. Now, they did so well here, they decided to go after the full frame market because that is the one way that you can get better image quality is by going to a larger size sensor. So they have partnered with Leica in a lens mount system, along with the lens manufacturer Sigma, to have a common alliance between these three manufacturers that would share technology and compatibility. So these Panasonic cameras and lenses can be interchanged with a category of Leica lenses and cameras. So that just opens the door to the versatility of the different options. Now on the Micro Four Thirds side, those cameras and lenses can be swapped with the Olympus, now called the OM system, lenses and bodies. And so there's a lot of interchangeability. And when you do change bodies and lenses across brands, generally most everything works, but not necessarily everything. Sometimes there's proprietary features that require the exact manufacturer from body and lens but I would usually say in general about 95% of the features are common that are gonna work back and forth from those shared manufacturers. Now these full frame Panasonic cameras are gonna be one of the best ways to go if you want to shoot video in a stills camera. They're gonna offer you a lot of features, great, great quality in here. The cameras are a little bit bigger and heavier for mirrorless cameras um, when it comes to these full frame ones, and so you're not gonna get that size benefit from other manufacturers and their mirrorless cameras. Next up, OM System, formerly known as Olympus. They make kind of your more traditional lineup of basic level cameras and then more features, more features, more features as you go up the line. And they have some very good little cameras that I think are very durable. They have uh, very good weather sealing on them. They're really nice cameras. I've taken these cameras on hikes and mountain climbs and canyoneering and things like that because the lenses are small, the cameras are small, they're very durable, and they still turn out very good image quality uh, for the size sensor that they have. And so they, are, they fit a good niche of photography where a lot of photographers do want something that is smaller and lighter weight, where that's a real priority. If you wanna talk about different, well, Leica definitely fits that category. They have a lot of different categories. Uh, traditionally, they were kind of known for their rangefinder cameras, and they have kind of a different style of full-frame rangefinder cameras in that they come out with a base model, like the M10 out there, and then they take off or they add just a couple of features and they come up with a new version of it. Uh, so the M10P, it's got the same sensor in it. They changed some of the colors, they added a little feature here or there, um, and then they come out with a new model. And so most of these cameras kind of do the same thing, but with just some very subtle, distinct differences between them. And this is a system that has been in place for geez, uh, about 70, 80 years now that they've had. I think it's closer to 70 than 80 at this point. Uh, but a lens mount that has stayed around for a very long period of time. They have dived into the mirrorless, the modern mirrorless world with both crop frame, full frame, and medium format cameras. And so they all have their own system. Leica's crop frame mirrorless system is rather small. There's a couple of cameras, there's a few lenses, 
Uh, it's a way to get into a small Leica modern system. Their SL system for full frame mirrorless has some very nice cameras that are extremely well built. They have very nice viewfinders. They share that lens mount with the Panasonic full frame cameras. Uh, there are limitations when it comes to the greatest expanse of lenses. You're not going to find as many options as you would, say, with Sony, Canon, or Nikon. And then they make some medium format cameras, which is a discussion for a whole other time. But their cameras typically are very well built, and they're priced very high to match that German engineering. Pentax. They got purchased out by Ricoh, so you might see them under the Ricoh name. They will actually say Pentax on the camera. They have not gone mirrorless. They are a smaller company. They have some very nice DSLR cameras. They, as I say, are smaller and they're just not able to compete as well as the other manufacturers in coming up with new cameras every two or three years. You do not see as many lenses here. If you are into the Pentax system, there's a good chance that you really like the system and you're very happy with it. And so it's great that they're still out there. They're still making some new lenses. They're still making new cameras from time to time. It's not the direction that I would point someone who is new to photography that wants a large system to be a part of. Uh, but what they do, they do a good job of. It's time to get into the recommended cameras. Now, before I start going through this list, I do want to say that the cameras that I have picked, I think are the best ones in this particular category. But the ones that I didn't pick could also be really good. Uh, you could choose almost any camera for any purpose if it really fits your style and way of working. But these are the ones, from my knowledge of how the cameras work and what the purpose is, what I think would make the best ones. All right, our first category is the unofficial family photographer. So if your main purpose is just taking pictures of your family, maybe you've got kids, you do a little bit of traveling, and you wanna document the experience and, and the people. What are you thinking about? Well, a lot of families have budgets. There's a lot of expenses running a family like that. You don't want it to be too big and clunky. You want it to be easy to take around and the camera might get handed around to different people to take photos. And so you want it to be an easy to use camera. One good choice here would be the Nikon D3500. This is a crop frame DSLR. It's easy to use. It's a very affordable camera. There's lots of lenses out there and I just think it's a nice, simple way to go. Uh, it's not the new mirrorless system that we've talked about, but if you just want a basic camera that'll last you for the next 10 years or more, yep, this type of camera will do that. Going with the new mirrorless system, I like the Nikon Z5. This does get you into a full frame camera. This is gonna be a little bit more money, actually quite a bit more money than the D3500, but it's affordable in the world of mirrorless in my mind. It does get you into a full frame camera. It's got in-body stabilization, which means you don't need to carry around a tripod for low light situations. It can be very good with video as well. Now, my favorite in this category, I would say is the Fujifilm X-S10. Now, Fuji uses a smaller size sensor here, which means the camera and the lenses are a little bit smaller, which I think is quite nice. We've got in-body stabilization. We've got those compact lenses in there and there's lots of dedicated lenses you can get for low light work. If you want to shoot portraits, uh, you can get some fast lenses working for work for use in very low light situations that are really nice. And as I say, Fuji has a pretty large lens system available for that and they're pretty available, uh, affordable lenses. And so it again is a mirrorless camera, so it's going to be very good for video as well. And so I think these are three excellent choices in this first category. Next up is budget-minded. This is where money is everything. If you're trying to get into photography, photography, I understand, can be very expensive. I know when I went out to go get my first camera, true story, I went to a store and I wanted to get, you know, a, a quality camera and they told me how much it, money it was. My heart just sank because my budget was about half for everything, bodies, lenses, and, and everything. And I really had to cut back my desires of what I wanted out of a camera. It's like, okay, just get me in the game. I want a camera to get me out there shooting photos. And uh, if, if budgets for your photography are tight, well, here's what I would recommend. The Canon T7, also known as the 2000D in different regions of the world, 
is about the lowest price interchangeable lens camera out on the market. And being a Canon crop frame DSLR, there's a ton of lenses and accessories out there available for it. It's something that you can easily use in manual exposure. And this is something that you can take very good photos with. Now, it doesn't have the latest technology. It doesn't have the highest in componentry in it. It isn't the most weather sealed camera, but it takes good photos and it has a large system that it's a part of. And so I could find myself using this camera and taking perfectly fine, great photos and having a good time doing it out there. Uh, there are limitations in how far you can take and what you can do with the camera, but it's a good starting student type camera. Another good option here, this one's kind of fun. It's a newer camera from Nikon. It is a cropped frame mirrorless, so you are into the new mirrorless world. It is this retro design, which is kind of fun. And so if you are wanting that or you appreciate those dials and physical controls on the camera, I think this camera gives you a lot for the money. And the top choice here is the Sony A6100. Now there is an A6000 that I think you can still find out there, which is quite a bit older. And this is a new and improved version of it for just a bit more money. And I think it's, it's well worth it uh, in that regard. And so you're getting into the Sony mirrorless system here. There's a large system. Uh, that lens mount is the same as their full frame system. These cameras are very small and lightweight. So if you are wanting to take them with you, put them in a small bag, very easy to do. And Sony is extremely good with video as well. So it's a versatile, uh, fairly low end or low priced camera that give you, gives you a lot of modern features. Our next choice is the aspiring student. So I've been in this category and this is where you wanna get the best camera possible, but you probably have a bit of a budget you're working with. And you're really looking about potential growth in the future. Where are you going with this? And I, uh, you're trying to get as much as you can out of the camera to start with, but you know that there's that limited budget. I think a great place to start is the Canon RP. It's, it's just something everybody knows. Canon is gonna have a lot of cameras and lenses in their full frame mirrorless system. This is the least expensive way to get into it. And so you are getting into a large pro system that is gonna be very, very common in the years to come. The camera is capable right now of taking very good features. It's got a lot of very nice attributes to it. Um, it's not the high end of Canon right now, but it is their entry level into their full frame mirrorless system. Next up is the Nikon Z5, and this is a competitor to the RP. It's gonna offer in-body stabilization as one of its features over the Canon. And Nikon, again, is gonna be competing with Canon in this full-frame mirrorless category, so this is another good place to start. Now, I think this is the best of the group here, but it is also the most expensive by double. Uh, and so that's kind of obvious why it's gonna be the best in this category, but this is kind of the base level from Sony, which, when I say base level, don't think low end. It's, it's pretty solid base in this case. Uh, it's gonna be offering higher resolution. It's part of Sony's full frame mirrorless system and Sony got the earliest start and they have been pushing harder and longer than anyone else in this full frame mirrorless category. So there are more current lenses available right now for it than for the Nikon or the Canon. So this has a lot of strong reasons going for why it's the best in this category. Next up, not really sure on the name on this one. I decided to call it the Urban Dweller. I'm kind of thinking of that person who maybe takes the commuter train uh, to work downtown. Maybe they work at a tech company. Maybe they just want to bring their camera with them out to lunch and they like shooting photos while they're on the go. And so they're looking for something that's really small, got a lot of technology to it, still turns out a good quality picture. I like the Fujifilm XE4. This is a really compact, it's a rangefinder style, which means it's got that flat top. It's got that viewfinder over on the back left-hand side, so it can fit into a very small uh, size bag. Fuji, of course, has those smaller size lenses in many cases, and Fuji makes a whole collection of very small prime lenses. And so if you are the type of person who likes to shoot with a single focal length lens, there's some really nice options that you have with this camera that can give you a very powerful punch in a very small package. The Panasonic GX9, once again, I said Panasonic has a lot of technology they bring with them, and this is gonna offer it in that rangefinder style camera. Good competitor to the XE4. 
Probably the best in this category is the Sony a6600. This is gonna offer in-camera stabilization, access to a very large lens collection because you can use both the full and the crop frame mirrorless Sony lenses in here. Great little cameras, a lot of fun. And all of these, that very small size that's very easy to take with you with lots of features. The Future Pro, all right, so this is for the person who's got a bit more money to spend. They know they are getting into photography on a very serious note. They may not be a pro yet, but whether it's a pro in profession or in quality of photos that you're gonna shoot, you wanna get in, maybe not go full hog wild right now, but you wanna get something that's gonna be a very solid step and that can put you in a competition level with other photographers in that category, all right? So the Nikon Z6 II, full frame, Nikon, you've got lots of growth potential here. This is where they're coming out with lots of new lenses and other new cameras. You've got a very good focusing system. You could shoot sports, you could shoot landscape with this, uh, but probably most important is that there's gonna be a lot of new lenses coming out for this in the years to come. The Sony a7 IV, this is their base level camera, but it does offer a lot of features. It is actually the, the newest introduction of many of the Sony, so in some ways it does have some of the latest features out here. It's got a access to the largest collection of mirrorless lenses on the market right now, which is with Sony. My choice uh, as the favorite in here, though, is probably gonna be the R6. Canon has, at least for the last 20, 30 years, been the top pro camera, and so that system there is gonna have a lot of lenses, gonna have a lot of support out there. This camera is extremely good at sports photography, shooting 12 frames a second. It's got a great focusing system. Uh, and it's, as I say, probably the best attribute is just being in that Canon system, which is where most of the pros are these days. Now, all of these, I think, will make a very good uh, start for somebody who is very serious about photography. All right, if you're more interested in video than taking still photos, well, some of these cameras are just better at shooting video. They either have higher quality video features, uh, they have more of them, they have the accessories that you might want if you are shooting video. So the Canon R5, I believe, was the first camera to shoot 8K video. Not that everybody needs 8K all the time, but it's a nice option to have along with some of these higher frame rates. Uh, this camera does a very good job at shooting video. Canon also makes full, full-on video cameras, and so they're very strong with video along with Sony and Panasonic. And so this would be the best offering that Canon has right now with a stills camera that also does good video. Now I got a blacked out camera here. It's the GH6, which is just on the verge of being, it's been pre-introduced, I haven't seen it. Uh, so if you saw this video very early on and it wasn't available, you could choose the GH5 Mark II, which is a current but lower end model. And these compact cameras have been a favorite for people shooting video for the last decade or so because Panasonic knows how to put a good video camera together. But this new GH6 looks like it's going to be following in the footsteps of the GH5, 4, 3, 2, and so forth, and be a great compact camera. Probably the best in this category is the Panasonic S1H. Panasonic, as I mentioned, is great at doing video. This is their full frame camera, so they are gonna get the highest quality imagery from it. It is also the one geared towards shooting video, so it's gonna offer the most video functions on it. Uses that common L mount, so you can use Sigma and Leica lens on it as well, but there is a wide variety of lens adapters and options that you can put different lenses on it. Uh, so it is kind of a specialty in that it does so well in this particular category. Now the vlogger is kind of like the filmmaker, but maybe with a lower budget, a little bit lower end, maybe a one man band having to do everything yourself. And so I'm thinking about cameras that are fast and easy to shoot with video, that have a flip forward screen so that you can see yourself on the screen and have a good stabilization system so that you can do walk and talks and move around and stabilize that image so it's a little bit easier to see. The Fuji XS10, we talked about this camera before, very good, has six stops of stabilization. We've got lots of different lens options. Being in that smaller size sensor gives you a little bit smaller size camera, easier to handhold. 
The Nikon ZFC actually works pretty good in this category. And if you want a little bit more stylish camera for shooting your vlogs, we've got that full flip out screen. With the right lens, you can get stabilization. The camera itself doesn't have it, so you do have to be mindful about which lens you put on there. But uh, some of you might like that retro design of it. Sony's most recent introduction, the ZV-E10, was really designed for vlogging in mind. It's uh, got a lot of features, it's got uh, selfie accessories for it, it's small, it's lightweight, it's very well stabilized, and it's very good with video. And I think that's kind of the clear winner of this particular category. Next up, cameras for the Landscape Pro. Somebody who's serious about shooting high quality landscape photographs. First off, you're gonna want high resolution so that you can make enlargements, big pictures to go on the wall. You need a wide choice of wide angle lenses. Uh, wide angle lenses are the most common for landscape. Yes, you use telephotos and they can make great images, but you want a good choice with those different wide angle lenses. And there's a number of different things out there that you could need uh, for that type of work. And it also needs to be a fairly durable camera. It might encounter a little bit of rain out there and you're gonna take it in a backpack on a long hike and so forth. So let's take a look at the best options here. Canon R5, great choice. 45 megapixels, which is a lot of resolution. In-body stabilization, so you don't always need a tripod. Dust and drip resistant. Canons are usually pretty well sealed against the elements, so it can handle being out there in hot, cold, dusty, wet, wet environments, and has a large collection of lenses. Now, the mirrorless lens selection is small right now, but with the adapter, you can add on any of the DSLR Canon lenses so you can get access to all the tilt shift lenses and other unusual lenses, fast prime lenses, extremely wide angle lenses, lots of different options for lenses there. Next up is the Nikon Z7 II. Once again, we're at about 45 megapixels in body stabilization, very well sealed body. Like Canon, you can use an adapter on there to get access to all of their DSLR lenses which they have a little bit more collection or larger collection right now, but you can see with both Canon and Nikon, they are pushing hard, they are bringing out new mirrorless lenses all the time, and so we're gonna have lots of choices going down the road. My top choice here is the Sony a7R IV, which now has a new Mark A version. They just upgraded the screen recently on that. This is a 60 megapixel camera, so it's got the greatest resolution. It does a very good job with in-body stabilization, has a nice flip screen on it so that you can shoot low angle uh, very easily. And Sony's been out there making these mirrorless cameras for quite some time, so they do have a pretty good collection of lenses and adapters so that you can use other lenses on there. And so all three of these would make excellent choices in this category. All right, the weekend sports shooter is somebody who is gonna be shooting action, but because it's just the weekend, this isn't their full-time job, and so this is where budget is a little bit considered in here. What cameras can do a pretty good job shooting sports without dumping all the money into the mirrorless purchase? All right, first up here is kind of an old school favorite, Canon DSLR crop frame camera. These have been a favorite for a lot of photographers who are shooting with telephoto lenses. So these give you a little bit more reach. There's a lot of Canon telephoto glass out there, so you can do this relatively affordably. You can shoot at 10 frames a second, which is gonna be very good in most situations. My first professional camera shot at 5.7 frames a second, and I was shooting sports and loving it. So 10 frames a second seems fantastic and should be good enough for most situations. Also gives you a 32 megapixel sensor, so you do get a very highly detailed subject in that. Going a little bit more modern, the Canon R6 I think is very good for this. It has a 20 megapixel sensor, which matches where a lot of the professional sports cameras are. When you're shooting lots of images, you tend not to want to shoot at the extreme high resolution. It just kind of bogs down the shooting in many cases. We can shoot it now 12 frames a second, and we do have a very adept and intelligent focusing system. Now the best for this in the category is we're going back to DSLRs. The Nikon D500 was a favorite and landmark camera for Nikon, and this is still a great camera for shooting sports. The crop frame sensor in this gives you a little bit more reach with all the telephoto lenses. It's got a fantastic focusing system that has a very broad reach for a DSLR in this case, 
um, tons and tons of different lenses out there and lots of AF customization so that you can get the camera tweaked to operate exactly the way you want it to depending on whether you're shooting birds in flight or track runners. And so I think those are all gonna make potentially very good cameras for those kind of weekend part-time sports photographers. If you really wanna get serious about your sports shooting and you wanna go mirrorless, well, let's take a look at some of the top of the line mirrorless cameras that have the fastest focusing and fastest frame rates. The Nikon Z9 has to be in this category. It's got a 45 megapixel sensor, which is the highest resolution in this grouping. It can shoot 20 frames per second in RAW. If you don't mind going to JPEG, which is where a lot of sports photographers do shoot at, you can get to 30 frames per second. You can also even get to 120 frames per second if you don't mind shooting at 11 megapixels. And this is the first camera to not have a mechanical shutter, at least as far as a mainstream photography camera. And so they are doing away with the mechanical shutter and this is one of the reasons why this camera is so good at fast shooting. Next up is a camera that's been around for a little bit and that's the Sony A9 Mark II. This is a 24 megapixel sensor, which I think is a pretty sweet spot for shooting sports for most people these days. And you can shoot up to 20 frames per second. As Sony's been around for a while with their mirrorless system, they have a large lens collection. So they do have a number of big, fast lenses that are available for it. My favorite pick in this category though is the Canon EOS R3. So this is using a 24 megapixel sensor and can shoot at 30 frames per second has an incredible focusing system that can track face and eyes, which is what a lot of the other cameras can do, but this also has eye control focus, which means it will focus where you are looking in the viewfinder. And this can be another tool that you can use for helping track your subjects down. Now, if you're wondering why I've chosen the Canon over the Nikon, because the Nikon does have more megapixels and more is better, yes, in many cases, but not all cases. Uh, that extra file size is going to be a little bit of a problem for somebody who really is dedicated shooting sports and does not need that file size. And so if you need it, then yes, you would go for it. But for most sports shooters, 24 megapixels will be enough and will simplify the workflow in many, many other ways. All right, one of the categories that is uh, close to my heart, world traveler. I love traveling. And when you travel, there's kind of a different set of criteria that's important to you as a photographer. Obviously, smaller size, lighter weight is gonna be important. You're limited on how much you can bring with you, so it's nice if it's feature rich, there's lots of things that you can do with what you have. You also are going to places, maybe for one time in your entire life, you want high quality images from there. My first choice here is the Sony a7C. I think this is a wonderful little camera. It is truly very, very compact. It is the smallest of the full frame cameras out there. My main gripe with this camera is that there's not enough lens options that are appropriately small for this camera. The uh, kit lens that is available with it is nice and small. There's a couple of prime lenses that are small. There's very few telephoto lenses that are really that compact on it. But uh, if you are looking for something that you can throw over your shoulder and really keep lightweight while still shooting full frame, Yep, this is the one that does it. One of my favorites here is the Canon R5. If you are a little bit more serious, you don't mind bringing a little bit more work. This is what a professional travel photographer would have. Uh, it is kind of a more full frame, full bodied mirrorless camera, but it is mirrorless. It's a little bit smaller. You can choose some of the smaller lens options from Canon, which they do have a pretty good variety and a very, very fast growing variety of lenses. And so this gets you into kind of the highest quality camera that would be good, I think, for travel photography. If you are a little bit more of the mindset of, I'd like to keep things a little bit smaller in size, then the Fuji X-T4, I think, is just a perfect travel camera for most people. The smaller body and smaller lenses are gonna fit in camera bags a little bit more easily. Yes, it has a cropped frame sensor, but it is still fantastic quality. I used a Fuji camera for my first trip to Cuba, and I have a poster image that is two feet by three feet in size, looks fantastic, and this camera here is of much higher quality than the one I took many years ago when I took that trip. 
And having that smaller size just means it's not as noticeable. It's a little bit more discreet. It's easier to do street photography and a wide variety of things. Sometimes, you know, people kind of hassle you about bringing big cameras into museums and certain locations. And these smaller size cameras can really help you get into those locations a little bit more easily. Another area close to my heart is Adventure Trekker. I'm thinking about bicycling and hiking and skiing and taking your camera out with you on adventures. And this is where size becomes even more important, as well as the durability of the camera. You're gonna be in snowy conditions, in wet conditions. You might have it in a pack that's getting rustled around and so forth. And so you need something that can really kind of take a bump and, and keep on going. First up here is the Panasonic G9. They do make a number of fairly good small cameras. This one is splash proof and dust proof. It's got a good focusing system and it's probably the best of these with video. So if you do want to shoot a lot of video route where you're out in the field, this would be a good one to look at. Another great choice here is the X-T4. This took our top choice in the travel photography, so it's gonna fit well here because it is also very well weather sealed. A lot of those nice old school mechanical controls for shutter speed and aperture, so if you enjoy that style of working with the camera, those are a lot of fun to work with. And I think the best in this category is Olympus. This is the EM1 Mark III. This is their higher end of the camera. You could also choose some of their lower end, but they're not as well weather sealed. This is probably the best sealed interchangeable lens camera out on the market today. Weather, dust, splash, and freeze proof, as they like to quote, we've got a good stabilization system, so you don't need to bring the tripod with you in many cases. And the micro four thirds system means that the lenses are gonna be smaller. You can have pretty big telephoto lenses in magnification, but small in physical size. And that's one of the main reasons that I like Olympus is that you can bring a small camera and have a large telephoto range uh, with you out there in the field without carrying a lot of weight. So those are my favorite picks among a lot of different categories. A couple other just quick sections. First, the top DSLRs. Now, Canon and Nikon are just not bringing out DSLRs like they used to. And I don't know if they're gonna bring out any more. It's possible that these cameras here are going to be the best DSLRs ever made. And these are some great picks. I've got a full frame and a crop frame pick from both Canon and Nikon. This is their latest generation. And I think these would be great cameras for anyone who wants to stay with DSLRs. These are gonna be good cameras that'll last for quite some time. If you are wanting to get into mirrorless, you know what, there's a number of great manufacturers out there and these I think are their best cameras to date if you are just looking for a top mirrorless camera that is good at a wide variety of systems. We've seen these cameras talked about in a lot of other places throughout this class. All right, let me give you a few final thoughts. Don't be concerned about trying to find the best camera. It's a useless quest that you will never, never complete. What you wanna find is the camera that is right for you, the one that you like to use, the one that does what you need it to do, but that you also enjoy working with. And a little bit of this is how adaptable you are. I've noticed that some people say, well, this camera feels so much more comfortable in the hand than that one. And I seem to have just more adaptable hands. It just fits me fine and I can adapt a little bit more easily, which just gives me a few more choices in which camera I can use. But if you want, I say, if you can, go to a camera store, pick up a camera, put it in your hand, see how it feels, turn the dials, look through the viewfinder. I really wanna see a camera and play with it in my hands before I buy it. And know that it's, that way I know it's right for me. I think you can be happy with, with any camera. I think any camera can work for anything you want it to. But learn about what you wanna do, figure out these features, and go out and seek the camera that is best for you. And then you can forget about all the reviews and what anyone else says, including me, as long as you found a ca camera that you are happy with, that provides you with the images that you enjoy, that is the most important thing. Well, I hope you enjoyed this buyer's guide. I hope you got some information out of it and that you will now be armed to the teeth when it comes to looking for the camera that's best for you.